audience. I'm not a, an, a curator. I'm not a conservator. I'm a downtown development manager. I've worked in community development planning and downtown development and historic preservation for years. Um, although uh, I do see a lot, a lot of similarities in what we're doing in the Vala Simpson Whirligig Park project and some of the questions we've grappled with about conservation and uh, whether or not to move the art in a way that we do with historic buildings. So keep that in mind when you're uh, listening to my presentation. So um, many of you may be familiar with Vala Simpson. I think four years ago at the last conference we had um, some of our folks that are working on this project talking. And um, Vala Simpson is from Wilson County. Um, he was born there, lived his entire life there. He died about two years ago when he was 94 years old. Um, and he uh, spent his uh, uh, adult life uh, as a large equipment mover and a rigger and a farmer. And uh, upon his retirement, he decided to take all of these uh, collected uh, pieces of material that he had, um, others that he purchased uh, or was given, and make giant um, kinetic sculptures. And he placed them in a field in Lukama, which is in Wilson County, North Carolina. And this is what the site looked like um, before we moved the art. And you can see on the site some of the reflective quality of the art um, Wallace put uh, reflectors, highway signs that he cut up um, onto all of his pieces. And so, um, although they are not uh, lit up when you shine lights on them at night, they look like they are indeed lit up or they are, they are illuminated. Um, and so, this place um, over the years had a variety of names such as Acid Park or the lights um, because when it was dark at night and you would drive up to the site and you would shine lights on it and everything was spinning and twirling, it looked pretty. Um, it looked pretty much like you were on an acid trip. <laughs> so therefore, Acid Park. Um, so my presentation is about um, changing and how the original site uh, of Vallis's, where Vallis's work was, is changing and has changed, and how the site where they are being moved to is also changing. Um, so over time, Vallis, uh, Vallis erected uh, their 33 uh, sculptures on this piece of land uh, that you see up here. Um, and over time, he, he didn't do a whole lot to maintain them. And so over time, they did, of course, deteriorate and rusted and seized up um, and um, in many cases started falling apart. And uh, when... Well, I'll get to that point later, but um, they, ha they had come into a state of pretty bad disrepair. And you can see, um, this is a close-up of, of one of the works called Saw Dog. Um, now I'm going to talk just briefly about Wilson, North Carolina. So uh, Wilson, North Carolina is the county seat of, of Wilson County, and Lucama is just outside of there. The site where Vallis' original work uh, was, was uh, it's about 10 minutes from downtown. And Wilson, North Carolina was the world's greatest tobacco market at one time. More tobacco was um, traded or auctioned off in downtown Wilson than any other place in the world. Um, and um, they had tobacco um, festivals and tobacco parades, you can see in this picture. Um, and they had a downtown full of old tobacco warehouses. Um, over time, as the auctions uh, changed, uh, the farmers had direct contracts with the tobacco companies. The auction houses were no longer needed. Uh, the whole economy of downtown started to deteriorate, and these beautiful tobacco warehouses, um, like you see here, the Smith Warehouse, um, were all torn down except for two. There are two remaining historic tobacco warehouses uh, in downtown Wilson, North Carolina. So that is the other place we're talking about. Fast forward um, to about 2008-2009. Uh, the community of Wilson decided to really take a, a look at how they were going to grow and develop. Would they grow uh, just uh, you know, at the edges with new Walmarts, or were they going to look um, at preserving their inner city and bringing life back into that? Um, they did a comprehensive plan. Again, I'm probably talking about a, sort of a 
little bit outside of what most of you folks deal with, but a comprehensive plan about how they were going to grow. And it focused mostly on center city revitalization. And uh, during this time, there were a lot of stakeholder meetings where the community came together and said, this is what we want for our community by 2030. And in several of these sessions, when they were talking about downtown, the public envisioned a park in the middle of their downtown in this old tobacco historic district. Um, and in this park, they wanted to see Vala Simpson's whirly gigs. Now, keep in mind that for many years, um, there had been different attempts to save or preserve um, Wallace's whirly gigs where they were at in the field in Lukama. Um, I was not in this community until 2009. I can't really speak to why all those didn't work out, um, but they didn't. And there was sort of a convergence that happened. The community envisioned this new place that would have whirly gigs, and they talked to the Simpson family. And until that time, Wallace had not wanted his whirly gigs touched or moved or bothered by anyone. He, like so many others, had experienced vandalism, criticism, um, and those sorts of things over the years. Um, and he just sort of wanted to be left alone, and he you know, didn't want anyone to, to, to bother him or, or the art. Um, but at that time, he was getting older, and he knew that he wouldn't be around forever. And I suppose he wondered how those whirly gigs were going to survive where they were. Um, and he and his family liked this idea of putting the whirly gigs in this park in historic downtown Wilson. And so in May of 2010, a partnership was formed between the Simpson family, uh, the Wilson Downtown Development Corporation, Wilson Downtown Properties, another nonprofit, uh, the North Carolina Arts Council, and the city of Wilson to create this uh, Whirly Gig Park. And so it began. Um, and you have the Whirly Gigs coming from the place of their original location, as you can see in the one photo, and moved into a big warehouse in downtown where the repair and conservation process started. Um, a few years ago, uh, I believe that Jefferson Curry, Dennis um, uh, Montagna from the Park Service, and Ron Harvey from Tuckerbrook Conservation were here talking about this process. Um, but we consulted with a variety of people um, on the conservation of this work, and um, we were able to come up with protocols. And we were also uh, able to engage the artist. Um, you can see in this picture here, that's Dennis Montagna, but in the other picture, you can see um, Wallace actually reaching out and touching the blades of one of the whirligig and his, whirligigs and his wife, Jean, in the red coat. Um, and so that was a, a real blessing, we feel, to be able to have the artist for uh, several years uh, working with us on this conservation process. Um, just a little bit more about um, the protocols and documentation. Another interesting thing that we were able to do is uh, Wilson uh, has uh, interesting demographics. We have a pretty high unemployment, one of the highest in North Carolina, again, sort of the remnants of that um, dying or changing tobacco market. Um, so we were able to partner with, um, yeah, with uh, local nonprofits that have workforce training programs to work with the, the experts in the repair and conservation headquarters and get some job training skills. And I think uh, 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 the, Terry talked this morning about um, working with others in the community and um, the interesting things of uh, working with people who um, maybe aren't used to showing up to work on time or <laughs> showing up to work at all. Um, so we had some of those um, wonderful journeys that we had together with people um, from different parts of the community, and I think that really enriched the project. And it also helped grow the awareness of Wallace and his work and the appreciation for his work um, in a much broader sector of the community than we could have ever hoped for. Um, we also... Um, designed a park. Um, we had a big public engagement process around this. Um, and this was a, a, an interesting process because we wanted the park to reflect the community and the heritage of the place where it was from, but we also wanted it to be really well designed. So we engaged some ex experts, we engaged the whole community, including people who 
thought that um, saving Volus's work was the stupidest idea they had ever heard of. Um, because, you know, if you get them supporting, then it's better to have the naysayers on your side than against you. Um, and this is uh, the layout of the park. And there's some interesting components um, in this design. So I talked about the tobacco heritage, and if you have ever been to a farm, you will know that things are laid out in rows. And if you've ever been inside of a tobacco warehouse where they bring the bales of tobacco, you'll see that they are laid out in rows. And so you look down a, a tobacco warehouse, an auction house, and you'll see rows and rows of tobacco. And so you see the ordering process of this design here. You see rows going all the way across um, the design of the park, and that is reminiscent of this actual spot where there used to be a tobacco warehouse that burned down. And so it's as if you were standing in that tobacco warehouse with rows of tobacco. Um, and then also hearkening back to Volus's original site. On Volus's original site was actually about two acres. This site is about two acres. And um, it was a square, and this is a square. And in the middle of the site, uh, out in Lukama, there's a pond. Now, we're not having a pond in the middle of the site. However, there is, you see that green space. Um, that will be an amphitheater, and that is to sort of rem reminiscent of the pond. And then when we grappled with how should we, how, where should we put these whirly gigs in the park? How should we arrange them? Should we arrange them by theme? Or how should, you know, how should we arrange them? And we decided that we couldn't arrange them in any better way than Volus had them arranged on his original site. And so the whirly gigs are placed around this green space, which reflects back to the pond um, in, in almost the same way that they were on the original site. And this is another picture of it. There's other features in the park, a water feature, a shade shell, uh, structure, things like that. Um, we also did a lot of uh, planning and marketing and education, working again with um, state um, and national institutions, and engaging the local community all the way down to uh, elementary kids in art class making their own whirly gigs and marching through the whirly gig, annual whirly gig festival um, with their with a parade with their little whirly gigs they made and then putting them in the site of the future park. Um, and of course, this has been done mainly through fundraising, so we've worked to uh, raise a lot of money and we're still working on it. We've, uh, we've raised about $4 million to acquire the art, repair and conserve the art, and we need about uh, $3 million more to actually build the park. So that's the point we're at right now. I'm raising that last $3 million. Um, and um, Wallace received, towards the end of his life, a lot of um, recognition. Um, he got some throughout the course of his life. I don't think he was ever looking for it, but it came nonetheless. And um, in 2011, he received the North Carolina Award, which is one of the highest awards you can get in the state of North Carolina. And then, um, just after he passed, um, uh, the, his whirly gigs were voted the official state folk art of North Carolina. So the other interesting thing that has happened because we're building this park is it has started to revitalize the downtown. So we have seen um, investment in our downtown. You can see on this map, there, the green spot right there, that's the park. And within a two block radius, there's about $20 million in uh, real estate investment that it has either happened, is happening, or is planned to happen. And you can see the, the, the spots on the map and most of it's directly um, adjacent to the park in old tobacco warehouses. Um, and you can see some of it here. Um, this was a, a project done with historic preservation tax credits, um, downtown living, which we've never had before, things like new restaurants. And we've uh, come upon, through this process, uh, sort of a plan to redevelop the downtown that centers around sort of the spirit of Wallace's artwork, this self-taught artist, this uh, person who made things with his hands, who, who, who uh, made things with things that he had, um, and um, a community that has a history of sort of uh, pulling itself up by its bootstraps as well. Um, an example of that, whoop, I'm going the wrong direction. Oh, I, I should also point out on this map, you can see the, uh, the yellow outline is the park, 
and then you'll see two corridors on either side of that. One is Goldsboro Street, which is going to be our Avenue of the Arts, and the other is um, Douglas, which is going to be our Avenue of the Sciences, because if you think of Wallace's work, it's sort of like art and science coming together, right? Physics, kinetics, wind energy, um, and of course, art, design, sculpture. Um, North Wilson, North Carolina also owns its own uh, fiber optic network. We have the fastest internet speeds in all of North Carolina, and this is a community-owned broadband system. And so this is where sort of that crossroads of charm and innovation comes, the sort of science and art come together. So this is how we're capitalizing on this. We're taking the idea of artists and artwork and self-taught artists and, and that type of thing, along with high-tech and um, uh, creation and innovation, and we're trying to populate this geographic area with artists uh, that are similar in some regards to Volus, or at least in spirit, as well as high-tech businesses. And it turns out that a lot of those high-tech workers and high-tech businesses like to be around creative um, artists, so it should be an interesting pairing. Um, the picture you see here is not of one of our whirly gigs. That is outside the Visionary Art Museum in Baltimore. Um, and really why we're doing this project isn't, it, it is to save the art, it is to respect the artists, and it is also to weave a tighter community. So it's, it's multifaceted. And I could talk a long time about how, that in, how that's happening in many regards. So here you see the site of uh, the future park. We do have 11 whirly gigs that are, have been uh, repaired and conserved and are up on the site. There will be a total of 31 of them. And um, in one picture here, you can see uh, the original location of Wallace's uh, workshop. And across the street from that is that picture I showed you earlier that had all the whirly gigs. Um, and then on the other side, you see a picture of Wallace's uh, widow, as well as one of his sons, um, on the day that we put up these whirly gigs and dedicated them. Um, I will say that one of the greatest joys about this project is seeing how much Wallace loved what was happening. He loved to see those whirly gigs move in the wind again because that's what he loved. He loved the motion. And he loved to see those colors come back so vibrant. He loved the colors and he loved the motion and he hadn't seen them like that in probably 30 years. The family is also very happy with it. And this is the site where the whirly gigs were. There are still four of them out there that we haven't moved. Um, and so it, it looks very different. And again, you're taking these works from a, 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 a rural setting to an urban setting. So there's a lot of um, things that we had to grapple with and questions that we had and um, things that we had to come up with good solutions for or come to terms with. Um, and now we're starting to think about the original site. Now, this original site is still owned by the family. Frankly, they kind of don't want anyone around it still. Um, and I think Jean, his widow, sort of wants to keep that space quiet and sacred. Um, but we're thinking about, even though it is outside the city limits, and I do work for the city, um, as a group, we're thinking about, well, what about this original site? And what about the workshop? And what about starting conversations with the family about what might become of the site in the future? Um, so those are some of the things we're thinking about right now. And again, another picture of what the park site uh, looks like now. And I don't know if that will show. And I just wanted to show you a little video of that day when we dedicated these first 11 so you could see the whirly gigs actually in motion. When you are out there on a windy day and they're moving in the wind, it's truly awe-inspiring. And my very last slide, I can stop this, it's just more of the same. But you can see all the cars driving by and slowing down and looking. Um, one, one more down, the very last one. Um, so
So I didn't learn this until the day we dedicated these whirly gigs. Um, but Miss Simpson, Jean, she told us that when they were, um, it used to be that when the, the, when the wind was really blowing and these things were really moving, Wallace would always look at them and say, look, they're going to town. They're going to town. And um, that day when we dedicated them, the wind was just really moving. It, was just like it, would almost, it almost brought me to tears. And I just thought it was so prophetic when she told us that story that Wallace would always say, they're going to town because literally, in the end, they have indeed gone to downtown, historic downtown Wilson. Thank you. <laughs>